All right. Good. Mike check. You're good. Mike check. Welcome. Welcome and uh, introduce Take yourself. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so my name is Anthony Bartol. I am a technical evangelist with Microsoft. Uh, funny enough, this is the first time I've spoken at Bad Type. So thank you very much for having me out. Really appreciate it. What we're doing today is we're doing what we call an Ask Us Anything. Um, and today specifically on identity management in Windows 10. And I know, you know, you probably, how many people have dabbled and played with Windows 10 thus far? A couple of you? So, why don't we get this? Yeah. Um, a lot of you have not. What's stopping you today from playing with Windows 10? Yeah, because already have a few code or triple code in your identity. I mean, server. Okay. It's okay if I mean the server. I can't already on the virtual box. Yep. If I install that one, can it come into the triple boot? The triple boot? I, I, I don't know. So I okay. Don't know. I'm fine. Okay. Um, anybody else? What's been holding you back? Yes. Well, I can download it on the same basis, but then again, I have to learn Windows 8 and I have to learn other stuff. So at the time, it was really not an issue. So, so, what I can tell you is you don't have to learn Windows 8 to start playing with Windows 10. There are some capabilities in the page which we'll talk about today, but if you start from 7 and wait to 10, you're okay. You don't have to wait until you So definitely start, like if I was, if you're able to, start dialing with it today. This is actually Windows 8. Uh, and the reason why I brought this up first is, how many, how many people have deployed Windows 8 in the so, so far? A couple of people. This, for IT pros, was the biggest stumbling block Nobody in IT Pro, not nobody, a lot of people didn't want to deploy this because of the start screen. Because immediately for the end users, they look at this and go, no way. I don't need the additional support calls to say, how do I work this? Right? Don't let this be a stumbling block on Windows 10. This now on Windows 10 is customizable in the fact that it's actual start menu. But I'll stop talking about it, showing on Windows 8 and I'll actually show it on Windows 10. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my VM right on my Windows 8. So I'll up, turn on Hyper-V and I'm going to connect to my Windows 10 machine. So I'm running this natively on Windows 8 and if you have Windows 7 uh, Enterprise or Professional for that matter, you can do this as well. You can actually enable Hyper-V functionality and run your Windows 10 implementation in a VM. And if you want to know how to do it, uh, how many people are familiar with our blog, 10itpro.net? Right? We have complete steps on how to set this up and run Windows 10 in a VM. So I'm going to put this in full screen, I'm going to connect, and my super secret password. And we're in. Here's my Windows 10 implementation. Went right to the desktop. Anybody want to see my start screen? I'll click on the start, start button here. Oh, there it goes. And there's my start screen. We have a menu again. Now, some people enjoy this. Some people like the start screen as a baby start screen. The one thing that we did on Windows 10 is we allowed for choice. Windows 8. Our biggest mistake was, here's the future of computing. Here's the start screen. Go run with this. Windows 10 has been refreshing the fact that we're asking you what you would like to see. Four weeks ago, I was in Redmond, sitting with 1,500 CIOs from around the world. And it was energizing to see the CIOs directly converse with the engineers as to what they would like to see the next iteration of the client software. We've actually pushed back the date of the launch of Windows 10, which we haven't talked about, and we haven't announced publicly yet. But to adhere to some of the changes that were great ideas that we hadn't even thought of before we deployed. Windows 10, from an IT perspective, is going to be the most controllable client OS made available by Microsoft today. How many people look forward to seeing Cortana in, in, in the business sense? And having Cortana in, in, you know, in enterprise. Some people shake their heads and go away. Full control 
out of the gate with GPO to enable or disable functionality on the software. Yes? Is it also, um, we have to uh, look around to see how we configure it, or is it natively, we can, you know, think logically and find out, or how does it work? So, here, what I'm going to do is this, because I want to take notes too, right? So, I'm going to open up Cortana, because I do use Cortana. I'm going to tell them to bring up my one note. There it is there. So, I'll load my one out. And there's my, from the, I have to actually add to that. So, that's my um, same session that we're doing today at the in Calgary. And we're going to name this one Fantag. Right? Um, so let's say you're, you're asking for um, findability of apps. You saw all these apps, right? I clicked on Cortana, typed in what I wanted to find and go. The other way I could have done it was just come here and run it from my most used. Uh, so there it is there from my most used. Exactly what you have in your uh, Windows 7 or older experience today. Another benefit, another benefit, here's my tiles, okay? I can extrapolate this as an XML file, and then I can push this out to all the computers to have to say, this is your mandated um, start script. This is the tiles that I've set for you. Remember, the tiles are not supposed to be icons that you click on from my applications. The tiles are supposed to be a glance at information, information that could pertain specifically to the enterprise that you support. So, if there is, let's say, spot prices or inventory catch up or, um, you know, even monitoring uh, air conditioning units for bakeries and such, right? You would have that all in your, in your dashboard and then all your applications here. You can probably say that you couldn't put apps there, but you could. Or, I don't want any of these at all. I just want this. Fully customized. Now, I can go on and on and on about the features, but I'm here to address the questions that you have. So I'm making this interactive. I don't have a deck. I'm literally here to listen to your pain points and what you would like to see the next offering of Windows to have. And if you have any questions for me, any announcements that have been made thus far. So show us a couple of different scenarios of desktop that looks different. Different scenarios of desktop that looks different. Let's see. Um, Windows 10 has done its best to make it so that it's more of a um, desktop experience or tablet experience on the fly. It would know on its own. So in this scenario here, I've now increased my, my uh, menu to take up the whole screen. So if I have additional tiles, which I do, uh, the whole screen will show it. And then I can minimize and put it back in as so. I can go back into my OneNote. Now, OneNote, if you look at it, it's actually a modern application. It's a flat app. But as you can see, I'm running it on the desktop. I no longer have to run flat applications from the start screen. So the application now will run anywhere and can run side by side with native apps and complete the same snap view capability. You just have to click on it. Yeah. I hate using this patch. That's the only thing. What was the functionality that they were calling it at the uh, event in January? Like, if you pull apart your surface, you'll automatically go to this. Yeah, so that's the tablet mode. So if I take this off from the keyboard, uh, it might not work on this one because I have it set up. I was going to ask if they have it in the, t in the yeah. technical preview. Does so it? what happens is, in future reiterations, when I remove the keyboard, it will ask you, do you want to go into tablet mode? And then when it goes into tablet mode, all the things increase in size, they make it a lot more quickly. Sorry to interrupt. Does any of you have a Mazdaq Zoom? Mazdaq Zoom, Mazdaq? You may have forgotten your Android in the car, it's down the street. Oh. oh. You better not interrupt. Yes. Uh, Mazdaq, hold it. Do you want to try a uh, real mouse? No, it's okay. I have one today. I just, uh, just didn't get enough. No, I, I didn't think I would need it, but I do. There we go. Am I good? I'm good. Okay, let me put this back up. The other thing that is coming is multiple desktops. 
So I can have multiple desktops, you know, assigned by IT specific to my job task. So if I'm a, if I'm a driver, I'll have, you know, I can swipe to the left and I have a second desktop that has it specifically to my functionality. Swipe to the right could be, you know, HR, other applications that pertain to my, my job. If you don't want to have that, you can lock it down to one desktop. Again, all control with the GPO. Um, future reiterations of System Center Configuration Manager will also provide you that functionality next, for the next reiteration, um, as well as into. You guys have any questions about any of the announcements that ever made? Does anybody have anything? Uh, integration with uh, OneDrive for system settings and all that stuff. Okay. So OneDrive and bridge. Okay, so OneDrive integration. Did you know today, if you have System Center in play, you can force to say whether they're allowed to store to OneDrive or not in Windows 7 and Windows 8. Uh, same functionality we made available in Windows 10. If you created a space on your on prem storage through workflows, you can also have that invoked to say, instead of storing it to the cloud, because it may not be a, uh, a capability for your organization, only have the ability to store to your work folder. And that work folder would be accessible by iOS, Android, and Windows, and Mac, securely through certificates. Right? <coughs> so that customization is already available today. Um, there are more capabilities that will be revealed for, for OneDrive in Windows 10. I can't go through all of them just yet. Um, but again, it's totally up to you in terms of the nice question. What you will or will not allow. But that hasn't changed since you know, Windows 7. In terms of the drive, <coughs> is this same drive in Windows 7 and Windows 8? So for the, for the most part, what we've been show, showing so far have been Windows 7 and Windows 8 drivers on Windows 10. Uh, of course, there will be additional drivers that will be coming up on Windows 10. But it, right now, it's, it's like when Windows 8 launched, you can use the Windows 7 drivers. So that doesn't change it. I have a good one for you guys. The surprise hasn't come up yet. How many heard of, how many people have questions surrounding around the free one year upgrade? Right? Anybody? Can I add that to the list? Is it is that okay? That one was a hot topic um, a couple nights ago. All right, so this is what I can tell you about this. If you are currently running Windows 7 or higher, you can upgrade to Windows 10 for free, okay? The one year means for that first year of Windows 10's official launch, so when they go and launch, public launch on Windows 10, for that first year, you can upgrade your computers to Windows 10 for free. After that first year, they haven't disclosed to me any pricing or what it's going to be the cost. However, the existing computers that are now upgraded to Windows 10 will have Windows 10 for the life of the device. There is no additional monthly payment, yearly payment that's required to run Windows 10 on the machine. The other question I get a lot of is, okay, well, I have an enterprise deployment and I have an SLA. Am I still eligible to upgrade to Windows 10? What I can tell you is this. It is important for you to sign the SLA, but it is not necessary to upgrade to Windows 10. If you have an enterprise machine and you want to upgrade to Windows 10 and you haven't signed the SLA, you can still upgrade, but the upgrade will occur machine by machine by machine. It means you would have to go to the machine and do the install manual, as opposed to pushing it out as an MDT or pushing it out as an SCCM. I agree. So that's why if you sign the SLA, then you can do that. You can push it out. So you have to make sure you talk to your Microsoft rep, make sure your documentation is all in order, turns into your SLA, and then you would be able to push out Windows 10 to your machines without doing it manually. 
what Microsoft is doing is, if you don't want to move forward with SLA, we're still offering the Windows 10 upgrade for, for free, but you would have to do it manually. So it makes more sense for organizations that do have an SLA to continue on to be able to do it remotely as opposed to doing it at each machine. Is that clear? Is it good with that? Uh, free money upgrade. Uh, currently, uh, how many versions of a Windows 10 come to the market? As I've been told, and this is exactly what I've been told by Redmond, this is the last major release of client software that Microsoft will be launching. Windows 10 will be the last Windows will be on. Does that mean upgrades and updates won't come out? Of course not. That will come up and come into play. Um, they haven't told us yet what that means. So 10.01, 10.7, 10.8, you know, that's all the main incremental upgrades, additional functionality, additional features. But um, they haven't told me in terms of the upgrade path what that means yet. So I don't have answers on that as of yet. You don't say it's a test of something. Then how it came on Windows 10 professional enterprise. So they haven't that too. They haven't told. I see. Uh, they haven't made public that there's going to be different flavors of Windows. As we know right now, it's just a standard version of Windows um, that works on all platforms. Um, the other interesting piece about Windows now is that the client software in the kernel is the baseline kernel for all devices. So for my Surface, for my phone, for my Xbox, on and on and on. Um, you saw the Surface app that runs Windows 10. HoloLens runs Windows 10. Um, is it the same experience? Of course not, but it's the same kernel. So what does that mean for developers? Developers can take these applications, and while you have a customizable screen size and, and possibly processor, you can still have the functionality for about 80% of the code to be transposed across multiple devices, which is a huge experience thing. The other aspect of that now is migrating the platform, not just on Microsoft product, but on iOS and Android as well. Okay. Um, another question about the one year uh, free upgrade. Yes. Is it going to be subscription down by like a after 365 or uh, As it stands right now, no, it's not a subscription model. So the one year free upgrade means as soon as you upgraded that machine, that machine will have Windows 10 for the life of the machine. So, so you just have a one year window to pick it up? Correct. You have a one year window to pick it up for free. Yes. After that one year, I don't know what, what the future is for that. But for that one year, you have that option of installing Windows 10 on the machine for free for the life of the machine. Now, we're also covering identity management tonight, so it's, it's not just about Windows 10. I think you have another question back there. So, with, you know, the release category, the preview of the release standard, yep. uh, Windows 8, and then they went to, you know, release manufacturing, and then they changed codes, and they took up start menu. Are they going to pull any stunts like this this time around, or are they kind of, you know, got bitten? One big time and probably not. I, I think what you're going to see is there are changes coming, um, even in reiterations of, of what you've seen in, in terms of technical preview. Cortana wasn't available on the last technical preview, you know, she is. Um, as you know, there's a new browser coming to you, which is not available on here yet, um, but that's coming as well. Are there changes going to happen? Yes. Um, but but what is it? You know, the last preview to RTM. Is yeah. Be, is it going to be like big changes or is it going to be like minor changes? What I can tell you is this. What's interesting is that the changes that are coming forth are being asked or being requested by you. Okay. Whereas previously, the, the changes that were being put forth were us thinking this is the way this should be done. It's totally different dynamic. Um, you know, we heard loud and clear start menu is important. Right? And that's from a user experience. So it's back. But if you wanted to have the start menu as you did on 8, you can do that. Um, as an IT professional, you can allow for that, but just allow for the right to enforce it. You know what I mean? I think the biggest thing for me from an IT professional standpoint is full control of what it selects. Super nice. Um, there's some security aspects um, that uh, I can't go into details with, 
but I will say that this will also be the most secure offering of Plenix software. Be aware though, you know, security is in the eye of the hole, right? So in aspects of Windows 10, the most secure client offering that's out there, I'm not going to say that it's 100% foolproof, no such thing, right? Um, because somebody will find a little bit way. But the technology that's being put in here makes it a lot harder and takes a lot longer for somebody to try to do that. And that's why the second piece of today, thank you to, to ask that question, is about identity management. Now, do you guys have an understanding of what they're going to talk about in regards to identity management? What's the number one identity solution made available today that 93% of organizations and businesses use? It's a profiling tool. If you've implemented server, sorry? Mm, Active Directory. Active Directory. So Active Directory is currently used in 90% of organizations today. Right? How many people have deployed NBN software? AirWatch, Mobile Iron, Sobe, on and on and on. Right? BlackBerry Enterprise Server. I'm certified up till 10 uh, on BlackBerry Enterprise Server. And what's interesting with that is, great, you secure the device. The device is secure. Right? Can you guys say with 100% certainty that the data that's on the device that is controlled by your MDN is secure? No. Rooting, jailbreaking. Can you with 100% certainty with whatever application you or management software suite that you're using, can you guarantee that that device is 100% secure? And it is going to be detected that the device has been rooted or jailbroken. No, you can't. Even our software can't. It, it can. There are steps in place that will allow to check to see if it's jailbroken or not. But as you know, there is other software that masks it and says, "Oh yeah, I'm not jailbroken. I'm fine." And then somebody goes out and downloads a three, a three terabyte uh, flashlight and installs it on their phone, right? So in terms of identity, we talked about Active Directory. In Active Directory today, we look at enablement. What is an end user allowed or disallowed to do? Are they allowed to access certain resources? Are they allowed to save files in certain, certain places? Are they allowed to go through different networks and different pathways? What if we were taking that identity services and attaching it to the data that they generate? Using it as the keystone in terms of data that they access on any device. So now what we're looking at is the devices as a whole are secured by whatever MDN you're running. Hopefully it's Intune and System Center Configuration Manager. And having the data be encrypted by the individual's identity. And the identity would flow seamlessly through all the devices that that individual can authenticate on via Azure Active Directory and federate access to that information, whether it be on device or in a SaaS application. It's a huge change in terms of the way that security comes into play. Because now what we're looking at is we're securing the device, but that's no longer just enough. We're also securing the application that these individuals are accessing, and we're securing the data as well. So it's a threefold. So in that three-prong uh, safety endeavor, it makes it a lot harder for thieves to try and crack into the data. Again, security is in the eye of the beholder. We're trying to make it a lot harder for them to do it. Nothing is full. But in that scenario, even the detection capability much more powerful than what you have today. Um, I'd like to make your um, encryption, the AES. In the past, you know something called the uh, Pro Freeze or Pro Freeze? Does it happen in the Windows 10 too? So Windows 10 will support you know, the blocker technology and it will support the AES capabilities. Um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part. Uh, uh, in, in, yes, I come here two fish. Some people are both fish, B O W F I S H. Both fish. Okay. Two fish, T W O F I S H. So I don't have information on that today specifically to Windows 10. I see. They haven't detailed in terms of the security capabilities, <laughs> but the standards currently in, in, in play will apply. And the BitLocker capabilities that are available today will apply to Windows 10 as well. Also, another question about the security. Uh, do they have uh, called the MPSA, Microsoft uh, Basic Security Analyzer? 
Um, so the baseline analyzer is available today, but not on Windows 10 because Windows 10 is not full is full baked yet. Mm -hmm. um, so you can use the analyzer on even more, but you can't use it on 10 yet. Not until probably really standard. Nice. Thank you. No problem. The other aspect to that, um, I sat in I sat through Dana's session in Toronto uh, three weeks ago. I love that guy because he comes out there and just you know shocks and awes everybody. Here's somebody's computer, and now I'm going to go into a PowerShell and, do, and find out their password hash. Here it is in clear text. Now I'm going to log into this guy's computer, and it was one. My favorite, my favorite demo of Dana Dan Apples. He was at the MVP summit in Toronto, and he walked around the room and took pictures of people's computers, and was like, "Here's a picture of all the computers that are in this room." So he has a picture of about, I think it was about 80 computers. These are all the ones that are unlocked that I can gain access to right now. So then from the 80, it went down to 73. And he goes, and these are all the ones that are Microsoft employees. And he went, he went down to 36. 36 computers, Microsoft employees unlocked computers sitting on those tables. I'm like, please don't, my, my not be there. Please let mine not be there, right? <laughs> and I'm scanning, I'm scanning the room. <coughs> the scenario is, you know, in terms of security, the way that we as entity is, is differentiating, differentiating itself every uh, time we have somebody new come to the workforce with their tablet, with their smartphone, with whatever device they're trying to utilize. And identity management is so important, more so now than, than before, because we have to prove that these individuals are the proper individuals to gain access to this account. How many people say passwords is enough? Right? I heard, my funny story that I heard is, it's in a, I'm delivering an IT camp. He goes, yeah, I go, I support this one guy. I literally look up in the ceiling and in the ceiling tile, he's written his password to log in on his computer. <laughs> right? These are the stories that we hear. <clears throat> How many people have deployed multi-factor authentication? For their clients or within their work, anybody? What's been the biggest challenge with multi-factor authentication? Is it user forgetting the password? User forgetting. Well, okay, so user forgetting the password. How many people have a key fob? Anybody deploy a key fob? Is it is it cost? Is it complexity? What is it? Both? Right. I have a five-year-old son. He loves Minecraft. Daddy has an Xbox One. Wants to play Minecraft all day long. That's, if that's all he would do, sit there and play Minecraft. And then he'd play soccer and he'd come back to Minecraft. Now, I have enabled multi-factor authentication on the Xbox One. I have an application on my device called the Authenticator. The Authenticator app is a free app that you can download on Windows Phone, on iOS, and on Android. In essence, it's a key file. And all I have to do is, when he calls me, he says, Dad, I want to play Xbox, I want to play Minecraft. Okay. Uh, have you done your homework, son? Yeah, yeah, Dad, I did my homework. Put your mother on the phone. Has he done his homework? No. Okay. Sorry, I can't help you, <laughs> right? But when he's done his homework, all I do is, okay, here's the code. Three, four, five, eight, nine, six, seven, whatever the six digit code is of that 30 second interval. Give it to him, punches it in, boom, the Xbox is on, you can play whatever games I've allowed him to play. And I've set it to expire after an hour. So they can only play for an hour, which is, you know, maybe I'm a little strict, but I don't want him on the Xbox for longer than an hour. So, I deploy multi-factor authentication in less than 15 minutes by authenticating his account to a family, it's a family version of family safe, which is an Azure Active Directory light implementation. In either a federated or synchronized model, you can deploy multi-factor authentication within less than 30 minutes for your organization and deploy over phone, over a text message, have you done that when you when you had to verify your account and send you a text message? Same way. Or what's even more interesting now is phone call. So if text message is not an option, hey, you can have them call the, the end user, and the end user would have to supply a pin that they've agreed to. And they would punch in the pin on the phone, and they would authenticate. That type of enablement, tenfold, made available in Windows 10. I unfortunately cannot go into details to it. But what I would say is, and he's aware, and he's been saying this across, across Canada, data apps hack that he uses today will not work on Windows 10. 
because the password will not exist on the computer. It's a much interesting time for client computing because of all the peripherals that are made available. This is a computer. Tablets are computer. iOS, Android, Windows, all computers. This is a computer. Right? GPS functionality, send and receive messages. I can now send messages since the last update, right? With the virtual keyboard being available on this guy. Uh, when's it coming to Canada? Hopefully soon. Uh, I picked it up and read it myself, but you know, it too creates and generates data. I went to the gym before I came out here today, so you know, track my heart rate, track you know my reps on what I was doing with specific weights. That's data creation. Who has access to that data? So Microsoft has a dashboard called Microsoft Help. Is it, is it open to the public? Yes. Is my information open to the public? No. Because I have to authenticate to gain access to that data. And this whole push for wearables and the Internet of Things, identity becomes 10 times more important. Because all that information that's out there, right down to traffic lights, to wheel, wheel rotations, to refrigeration units, to how well or poorly kids are doing in school. All this information that's being captured, who has access to it? Who has rights to it? You know, we, we, we move so quickly to gain, oh, I want to put up Internet of Things, I want people who have smart watches, and that, it's great, but what about the security aspects of it? You know, hey, I'm up for a job, and it's, it's sending the signals to the dashboard that I'm up for a job, and somebody's monitoring my dashboard, hey, it's perfect time to go rob his house. Right? Identity management, very much important as to who gains access to what data, and when, and why, and from what device, or from what OS. Again, all controllable by IT. And that's the one thing I want to try home here. This is a totally different, you, you, you can take it for what it is. You know, you can take all this Microsoft guy from the spiel. I'm being quite honest here. This is the most controllable OS offering made available to IT professionals. Soup to nuts. You have the ability to completely control it. Now, I will definitely suggest that you do not lock down the device. Right? Because then you guys have shadow IT happening. You guys know what shadow IT is? We're in a day and age now, back in the day, you deploy a BlackBerry, there you go. A couple settings are locked out. The user, yeah, it's fine, walks away. In today's world, you think that flies? Yeah, give me your iPhone. I'm gonna lock it up so you can't do nothing until you go back. What do you think happens? Kids go on Bing, I'm gonna say Bing, but they also go on Google, sure. <laughs> and they'll find a way to figure out how to gain access to their devices. My favorite story, um, with the multi-million dollar investment that the uh, city of Los Angeles deployed with iPads. In less than 17 minutes, the kids had cracked the software that was on the iPads this disabled them from going to Facebook and other sites that they shouldn't be going to. 17 minutes. These are high school kids. Right? So, you're in a scenario now that you've had identity management governing whether these kids can and Cannot do so. And that multi factor authentication also extends out to Office 365, which is free for students. That's why identity is such a big thing in this day and age. It's for security, it's for enablement, it's for security to, to thwart not only malicious coming in, but malicious going out. In a generation that'll be the most tech savvy ever. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. My five year old goes in, logs onto his tablet. He's doing his Raz Kids homework at five, the senior kindergarten. I don't remember seeing a computer. The computer that I saw was a Commodore 64 when I was 16. We had one of those. <laughs> right? That's it. And now they're, you know, my son at four, Daddy, I want a tablet. What do you mean you want a tablet? Oh, tell Santa I want an iPad. No, no, no. Daddy works for Microsoft, not buying you an iPad. <laughs> four years old, he's sitting on Santa's knee. Santa, I'm on a Microsoft tablet. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, but that's the thing, right? So, so we have the most, as, as Andrew said, we have the most technology-savvy um, generation coming, coming forward. And they want access to everything. They want to do everything. 
And if we go out and say no, we will find it. Right? So we're in a different paradigm. You can't just lock, set it, and forget it. I hear that all the time. Oh, MDM, we just set it up and walk away. It doesn't work anymore. Right? And Microsoft Ant kind of understands that. That's why Azure Active Directory is so important. From a on-prem to cloud, if it's enabled by IT. Now, I've talked a lot, I don't usually talk a lot of these things, but I want to get, make sure that your questions are being asked in terms of what you like to see, what what keeps you up at night, you know, what are you worrying about Windows 10 when it gets launched? How many people, we only had a couple people with their hands up in Windows 10 uh, in terms of playing with it already. I showed you how to run it as a VM. You also obviously have the capability of installing it directly on the machine as a, as a bare bones install. Windows to go, anybody? You know you guys know what that is? So specific USB keys, uh, if you look at canitpro.net, you can find out which ones are, are applicable. And you can install Windows on a USB key as a Windows to go implementation. What's okay. the minimum size? Uh, 32 gigs, so 32 gig key. And you can take Windows to go, I would plug it into my uh, computer, and it would boot up from the USB stick, and I would have Windows 10 on. I uh, should have brought some for us. I should have, you know, but I'll write that down. Yes. I'll see if there's a way to get that. There you go. Apple even tried. Sorry? The Microsoft even tried. Yes. Apple is the Windows Sorry? Apple is the software. Well, Windows is at minimum 32 gig drive. 32 gig. 32 gig. I'll add up to it. So you can do a Windows to go key. You can also spit up. An IS session on Azure of Windows 10. So we have the template the image on Azure. How many people have downloaded on Azure right now? A couple of you? You can spin up Windows 10 on Azure and start playing with it there too. Right? And then, of course, there's the bare install if you want to do a full install on your machine or the dual boot. And you're, you're talking, I, I would love to see if that would work. I think, I think if you were using MC boot, uh, which is a third-party software, which will allow you to select which image you want to boot from. Now, you probably want to have a big hard drive to do it, um, but I think it would be possible. I'd love to know if you were successful in doing it. I think so. Okay. I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, it's Apple Care. Yeah, I've uh, also said they have a very new uh, engine, is that for the export? Uh, I is for the repeater the explorer or this uh, certain engine feature. Is that not thing? Do you know that? I forget it. So new browser. Yeah, new browser also means. Yeah. <coughs> so you guys are you, you've heard this, right? So we have a new browser called uh, Spartan, yes. which is the marketing name right now. It's not the official name. We don't know what's going to be called. What's it called? Spartan. They're going to the Internet Explorer. Sorry. They're not calling it. They're not calling it Internet Explorer. They're calling it Spartan. Spartan is in the whole halo because they've already called the assistant, digital assistant Cortana. I don't know if Spartan's going to stick. We'll see. Right? I'm almost certain it will, but we'll see. Um, Spartan is a completely new browser. The biggest challenge with IE has been how many people have a current deployment of intranet sites that require a specific version of IE to operate. A couple of you see it, we've seen some, some heads on it. The biggest challenge with that has been quality. IE6 pretty much was the default de facto for a lot of internal sites, then IE7, and IE8, and everything was built on top of the existing IE6. So when you're building more code on top of existing code, what happens? It's down. Right. So Spartan, or whatever it's going to be called, is a completely brand new browser from the ground up. Does that mean IE is going to go away? No. IE will still be made available because whatever existing web pages you have right now that require IE6, IE7 will not operate in Spartan. Very similar to if you're running Chrome or Firefox or what have This was done from an aspect of Spartan being the new, minimal, glanceable browser. IE is still available, 
But if you're complaining about the load times and compatibility and on and on and on for newer sites, then Spartan would be the way to go. Now, I can't say more, um, but what I will say is it's going to be on par with the newer browsers that are made available. Is it a uh, smart one? It's uh, faster running than the Chrome? Yeah. I will not say faster. <coughs> I will say, so understand that Chrome doesn't have the same problems that IE has in terms of bolting on functionality for compatibility. It being a brand new browser coming out puts it on par with Chrome and Firefox. Right? Do we have you know benchmarking to say it's better, it's faster? No. Um, nor will I say that. What I will say though is the web now becoming more and more proliferate, not just surfing, but content creation, creating documents in Office 365 or Open Office or whatever other application you utilize, line of business apps, right? That take advantage of the quickness of certain browsers to have that available now being made available in Spark. Still offering IE, however, specifically targeted towards enterprise and business. Spartan is going to be the consumer. And the point, the point, sorry, the quickness, because most of my clients or friends, any friends, they like to hire that they get the Gmail faster than the other. <coughs> well, this thing, so that's great. So you're getting Gmail faster on your Chrome browser, right? And I would hope so because Google makes both, right? Is, is Outlook.com faster in my e-browser than Gmail loading up? I would say no. I would probably say because of the fact that the Chrome browser doesn't have the legacy that IE has, that we just talked about, I would love to see the race on support browser. But I don't, I'm not going to say it's going to be faster. I'm going to tell you it's going to be on par. It's going to be a very similar experience that we experience right now. Anything else? Come on, guys, you have some questions for me. Yes. What type of download will support? So when's that going to uh, it's this thing can change when you tie in like dual factor authentication and all that. Is it coming with? So, two factor authentication made available on 7 or 8 um, would still apply in terms of you know, using the authenticator app because it's, it's no different than using a key fob today, right? Um, so, the functionality will be made available for the older versions of the software 7, not lower than 7, right? Um, although, if you're running 7, it'd probably be best interest to migrate to 10, right? Um, you might not want to migrate to 8 at that point. But of course, it's going to test first, right? 100%. Um, the other aspect of that is that information rights management has been in place since uh, since Exchange uh, 2012. So you have the availability right now to lock down my identity uh, through Exchange, through FIM, uh, and through Azure Active Directory in terms of the documents and data that you have on the device already on the side, right? So on 10, it's just going to be more submersive in terms of its capability. Okay. But good question. Okay. So just give me one second to that in. Uh, MFA. Multi-factor authentication. So from 7 going to 10, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the gap between the hardware and the development is, you know, big. But is it um, Windows 10 is not demanding on the hardware? Yeah. Uh, CPU, memory, no. so on. It's all been so. I'm running so I'm running Windows 10 on a couple machines. I, I didn't bring them all because I the airport was have fun with me wanting to the gate. Uh, I have it running on a six-year-old Lenovo Celeron computer. No issue. I have it running on a tablet that is. Um, a quad core atom processor, 1.7 gigahertz, 1 gig of RAM, 32 gig storage, running without issue, uh, running it in the VM here, running it on an IS session in Azure. I haven't, you know, I haven't come into issues with it. Um, does that mean that performance is going to be the same from a six year old Celeron to a newer machine? Of course not, right? And that's not the foolish here. But, uh, if you have existing hardware that's running 7, you'll have no problem running 10. Right? Because if anything, what I can tell you is every time you release client software, the code base behind it gets better. Right? 
the requirement still the same as one if at least uh, uh, the CPU uh, 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 can be keep for this big for it the same requirement. Same requirement you have for Windows 7. Okay, so I have one more question then. Uh, on the Google, they have Google Map on the Microsoft, they come with the Microsoft Map. So there is a map from software to me. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking it will make it to 10, that doesn't the big max. So I would say yes. Um, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Uh, so to status and more of the RBs uh, from the oh, Perfect. Okay, so RM based. Units. Windows RT, right, and RT services, when they first came out, they were the instant on, instant gratification to information. The trouble with those were, personally, we shouldn't have included the desktop because it wasn't meant for that type of functionality. It was supposed to be a, I click on the tile, I see my information in the lens, and run the application itself. RT, uh, there is an upgrade path for RT. Uh, I can't detail it to you guys as of yet. Um, but RT as an implementation is going to change. We're in a scenario now where I can get instant on, my, my service boots up in 10 seconds, right? Very, very similar to an iPad or to an Android tablet, right? So, you know, for ARM, is there now a need for ARM tablet and a uh, Intel or AMD machine? Probably not. But ARM is interesting offering because it can fit into a lot of smaller spaces and doesn't have the same cooling requirements that an Intel based or AMD based chipset would have. <coughs> so, what I will say for ARM is its utilization and its enablement will differ, but the capabilities will, will still be familiar. Again, I can't go into further detail, but the RT, the light of the RT units will be taken care of. There will be some sort of an upgrade path for them. I don't have details as to yet what that is, but there is something in play. Sounds almost like they're really calm. How so? That's interesting. Okay. Which one are you using right now? That's the AT vest? Uh, yeah. I heard the Windows phone like text message come in and I looked and it wasn't your phone, it wasn't mine. <laughs> So what is this guy doing about? So the running tell right now is any Windows Phone 8 device will get an upgrade to Windows 10. We are working with Samsung. I'm actually at Samsung. I'm part of the reason why the Samsung and TVS came to camp. Not gonna lie, I'm a little bit proud of with that, even though they pulled it out for about three months. Not long. Not long. Um, Every Windows Phone 8 device today will run 10. The, the, the thing to remember with that, with respect to that, the device that you're holding in your hands right now is a dual core, 1 gigahertz processor, 16 gig storage. There is going to be some functionality that will not be available for your device. Right? Um, but what's interesting is I can walk into a Microsoft store today. So you can walk into the one of these at Metro Town Hall. And you can buy a Blue Junior for 79 bucks. Yeah, I got my brother. Right? Blue Junior for 79 bucks. I would say buy the Blue HD. Uh, the Blue HD, I think it's 149 $149. And you're getting a quad core, 8 gigahertz, uh, sorry, quad core, um, 1 giga RAM, 32 gig of storage, expandable up to 64, no, 128. Uh, quad core 1.7, and an 8 gig, uh, 8 gig, sorry, 8 megapixel camera. On the back in each screen. Don't drop the device because it will break. But it's 150 bucks. Wow. I can walk into a Walmart and buy a 635 for $89 in a blister pack and walk to the store in blister pack. It's crazy in terms of the technology. It's actually 49. Is it 49? There you go. 49. In the US, it's 49. In the US. I can walk into the Microsoft store today and buy the HP HP uh, 7 Stream, which is a tablet, 7 inch tablet, quad core, 2 gigahertz processor, 1 gig of RAM, 32 gig storage, 89 bucks for a tablet 
Oh, and by the way, it's a full-blown operating Windows 8. It is upgradable to Windows 10, and it includes Office 365 for one year, and Office 13 on the device for itself, on the device itself, and the Lightroom device for 89 bucks. So, would the five-core units be get all the functionality of Windows 10? Yeah. How about the release date of Windows 10? So Windows 10 will be released before the end of the year. I know that. That's <laughs> <laughs> all I can tell you. They're not going to miss Christmas. Hang on, hang on. How about the mobile devices? Are they going to get released at the same time? Or is it going to be delayed? Um, I don't have an answer to that as of yet. Um, it's promising that we have technical preview made available. Um, unfortunately, it's not on all devices, but it is coming. Um, there's some capabilities that are on storage that require certain operands that we're working on. Um, so we don't have all the details on that yet. Um, I don't know if it'll be launched at the same time, a week later, a week before. I don't have an ETA. My fingers are crossed that we have it all at the same shot, you know. Um, but you would agree that we want to make sure that this has got to be a solid launch, right? We don't need any headaches and issues in terms of software not working properly and getting out. Oh, you know, another screw up. No, 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 no. We want to make sure that this is the proper release, right? Um, so I don't have an answer to you as of yet. Trust me, I'm as excited. I, I, I literally went out when I was in the States last time I bought a Minder. Um, I picked one up for 390 bucks taxes in. And uh, this is a quad core, um, the, the 800 Snapdragon processor, 2 gig of RAM, 32 gig storage, the fastest uh, Windows phone in the market today, unless you buy a 1520. A little bit big for me. A lot of people like that big screen size. Actually, do you, do you know what the number one Windows phone is in Canada? Oh, sorry, number number one is the 520, 530, or 535, low-end phone, $49, $50 phone. Number two was the 1520. Do we sell the 1520 in Canada? <laughs> nope. <laughs> right? So popular that um, when one of the banks, one of the major banks launched the app, they took into consideration the devices that were launched in Canada in terms of screen size and built specifically for that. And the biggest complaint that came in was all of five, the 1520 users were freaking out that it looked like it didn't look well on their device because it had, it had a higher resolution. And they had to fix that. So we had to acquire them a 1520 to give to them to fix to appease those users. That's how big of an install base are our 1520s. These are people that went out on expenses and are on other sites and bought the devices themselves and put it on the package here. Now, I'm not saying it's what everybody should go and do, but it's interesting the paradigm of gene and, and, and it's wondering, you know, what are the characters doing now? And the fact that nobody's going out and locking themselves into two, three year contracts anymore if you can buy a phone for a hundred bucks. Right? So, you know, why are we? Buying phones at six, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars. It's another big question that people are starting to ask me, right? I was in Mexico three weeks ago and they just did a deployment of 635s. So $150 phones, 635s, they replaced all their blackberries, and they wrote a modern app that they can extend on tablet and on phone as to when they go into a room, if the room has been cleaned or not. And if there's a maintenance issue with the room, to report it in the app, in the app to get fixed. The guy who coded this tied it into a SQL backend and wrote the code in a day and a half. As a modern app, and the same code resides on the phone as it falls on the tablets that they deployed in the carts uh, for the cleaning staff. Northwind Traders. How many people remember Northwind Traders, the fictitious? Uh, app. How many people saw the build presentation that they did last year where they took 80% of the code from Northwind Traders and embedded it into an operand in Visual Studio and created it in the same format but in a modern app? And now you have the functionality to run it natively on the desktop. And that means that that modern app will work on phone, tablet, and PC. It's a much different era in terms of computing, in terms of access to information and data. And again, who has access to that data? And how does that get secured? 
If, if computing now becomes a ubiquitous platform, this is a computer. Who's to say I can't use Meerkat to make this to a wireless screen, roll out my Bluetooth keyboard, and work away? And then use this as my mouse, I just touch on the screen like this. And it shows up on the screen in front of me. It's a quad core processor. What's stopping me? I have flow office on here. Where did Excel power from? What is computing? Right? And how does that get secured? How do, how do we ensure that when I log on this computer, I have all the apps that I require and all the apps that I can choose from that's been, again, allowed by IT, whether it be SaaS or on-prem. And then if this breaks and I go to the next computer, same thing. Right now, it's okay, I gotta image this machine and deploy all the da 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 da. We're all, you know, having ADD now. We want now. I'm not gonna wait half a day for you to set up my computer. I want it now. I want this machine running. I want this to go. A lot of things to be addressed in terms of the way that we view computing these days. And the security aspect also has to change because just securing the devices you know is not enough. Questions? Legacy app support. Legacy app support. Win 32 apps. Win 32 apps. Okay. So I don't have an answer for you on Windows 10 today. Um, what I do have is, like I said, the North Point Trader scenario, where they've taken the app and they ported it over to a to a modern app. They're making that easier for developers to do. I think the biggest struggle has been I've seen a lot of uh, line of business applications that were built on Windows XP. Healthcare is one of the bigger ones, right? This app runs on Windows XP. I have to use Citrix or a terminal services client to push it out to these devices and to run it up. Citrix obviously is working on client for Windows 10. Um, I don't have an ETA or when we're going to launch that or what have you. Probably close off to launch. Um, but Microsoft is, in, is making it uh, easier via Visual, uh, Visual Studio to enable, if you own the code, <coughs> to port it over into a modern app. And now the fact that I can run the modern app on the desktop as if, as if I were a regular application, it makes it more easy. And if I change the device into tablet mode, and, I, and it's a touch-friendly interface now, because it's automatically enlarged the buttons specific to the modern app capability, even better, right? Again, providing choice if you still want to run it in terminal services and you have a mouse and keyboard and you're running it on a CRT2 computer, no problem. But again, there is some, some, some legwork. It's not an instant change it over and away you go. Right? If an old app runs on Windows 7, it will work on 10. If an old app runs on Windows 7, it will run on 10. Yeah, that doesn't change. But if it runs on XP and it doesn't run native on 7, it's not going to work. So, we have any other questions? No? Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, With Visual Studio, the reason why not, a lot of people are not doing Windows apps is because, well, Visual Studio is on Windows now. So, it seems like there's always this temptation that, well, there's always going to be a uh, big old Loki with desktop environment. Yeah. In the whole world, everything. It seems like that Microsoft is going towards that, but having a Windows app uh, environment where everything will be deployed, but not everyone can. Yeah. So if you have an iOS or Android tablet, you can't run Windows 32 app, right? Hence the reason why SaaS applications exist, right? So you have, you know, in our case, we have Dynamics, right? Um, we have Salesforce, we have, you know, other people that are out there, and they're browsers, right? Same functionality may be over here. What I'll ask you, though, is, in those scenarios when you have the SaaS application deployed, and you're given access to all the, you know, employees, you may have a small firm or a large firm, I don't know what, what you're coming with. What happens when an individual leaves or is like go from the organization? Is there a repository to say, here's all the applications that they have access to? Right? There's a lot of orgs that don't have it. Right? They don't have documentation somewhere to say this is what they have access to. Do you know if they is, is, is it given the capability, the end user given the capability to change the password on, on like you know, put any password they want? Do you know the new password that they put in? Do you have the, right? There, there's a lot of, you know, in terms of complication in regards to that. In an identity management scenario, when you're using Azure Active Directory, you have the ability to set up 
a federated access to that SAS app specifically in the end user's identity. So it makes their AD your AD implementation, you can store an object that would have the credentials for that specific SAS application. And even if the end user changes the password, you would have access, it would automatically update and federate and say, okay, this is a changed user. So if that individual leaves or it's like, no, when I disable their AD access, it also disables the SAS app seamlessly. And you don't have to go in and say, disable this, disable this, disable this, disable this. Because we as IT professionals have all the time in the world, right? Right. And we need to remember everything because if something happens, somebody gains access to data, who gets blamed first? We do. So trying to make it easier in terms of, you don't have to know this big book, oh, this person got let go, okay, we're gonna table this app, this app, this app, this app. What happens if you miss one? Right? That's why identity management is so important. Is that, is that okay? That's okay, I have a follow-up comment. It's like that, it makes it administration look more You might have where you're just wanting to see that app. Yeah. Uh, and it's using this particular app, you have to individually deploy it manually, and then you have to control all of the, uh, I guess, who has rights. So yeah, if that person leaves the company, that seat is already taken. Even if you remote it, that was his job. I'm, I'm not sure maybe the model does. So are we talking the SaaS or are we talking on-prem? Well, it's, I'm not actually talking about a Windows app. Okay? Windows app, so we're an on-prem app. So okay, I work from the SaaS aspect. Okay. So, okay, no, no, it's fine. So, sorry, no, no, okay, no. Um, so there is functionality coming to Azure AD for on-prem. Um, it has been a challenge in terms of burning the license and then it's not retrievable, what have you. Um, that's going to change. I don't have details as to that today, um, but it's going to be made a lot simpler with Azure AD. Um, no answer for it yet. Okay. Right, so I don't have a straight. For SaaS, I have the answer already. Um, there's 2,400 plus SaaS applications that we have agreements with for the templates for to have a functionality, um, but on-prem we don't have the answer yet. But that's coming too. I have one more question. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's the Windows Server upgrade path for, like, we know we have Windows Server 2012, or something else like that, but uh, what's, I wanted to know if there is a direction for at least upgrade path for Windows Server, not given Windows 10 in my comments. So, okay. So then, are you talking for Server VX? Yeah, so let's say you're. So VNX, right? So you're on 20, you're on 20, 20 12 R2 yeah. currently. And what, what the path is, I don't have an answer. The two way to relate to that one. Yeah, it's, it's just the general direction. Yeah. I mean, that was one of those time where the VA, that's it. So. Yeah, I don't have uh, For the server side, I don't have an answer for that. Not yet, still too early. But and, we, and we've asked recently. Okay. Right. Okay. So no, nothing yet, but we've asked, yeah. So for any how do you just compare with other enterprise class management companies like uh, applications such as uh, CA, Energy Manager, Site Manager, or uh, Oracle has uh, Energy Manager as well? So, you know, in terms of features, I know you mentioned it's got SaaS. Um, SaaS functionality, multi factor, multi factor capabilities that are built in as opposed to bolt on. Um, I think the biggest thing is. When you've deployed any of the, the um, identity management tools that you've put into play, is that alongside AD, or is that right? So you so you have that you have that as a bolt on, right? So again, it's another identity solution that you have to manage um, that you have to be concerned about. You know, is there functionality? What if there's a break between the two, right? Now they can't authenticate the domain, the domain so it means nothing that they have a C A connection, right? Am I saying go on and rip and replace? No, I'm not saying that. Um, because everybody has their own solution that has a requirement for their organization. You know, um, but what Microsoft wants to do is make your life easier by having one identity management tool to, to enable all as opposed to having multiple. Again, if that's your requirement, you have that, I'm not saying go out and rip and replace what you have. Um, but do take a look at what's coming because there may be a fit 
Um, maybe there's you know less dependence on your other identity management tools, but maybe you still require it. Um, it's 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 pretty much investing. You have to invest in your own. I can't say, hey, you know, it's better. Don't you know? I'll never say that. And you know, it, it, it's again because everybody's need is different, right? Is there another product that's comparable, like in addition to AD or uh, Microsoft Dynamics or coming up? See, that's a hard question to answer because the fact that Azure AD's capabilities and functionality changes increases every month that we go forward. So to say that it's on par with this, maybe for the next three days and then it's something else changes, I don't know. Uh, what I won't say is, I won't, I won't say ADs, Azure AD is better than anything else that's out there because there are some nuances with the other identity software that again may be <coughs> a requirement of your organization that Azure AD does not address yet or may never, don't know, right? That's again, it, it's something that you would have to compare in terms of your functionality specific to your organization on, on what you want to address. The best thing to do, spin up a lab, right? Um, I have a couple of blog posts on how to do that in different ways to make it easier for you. You know, again, we have all these servers kicking around that we can spin up our own labs, of course not. Um, that's also a challenge, but there are ways to you know, do a loop in your machine, you know, run it in a VM, that you can test out the functionality and see if it's a perfect fit for your organization. Uh, we also have a great deal of documentation on kn2pro.net that addresses federation of Azure AD, synchronization of Azure AD, on and on and on, what that means and what that could mean for your organization. And then, of course, there's the TechNet. You guys are familiar with the TechNet VLADs? So there's these labs. We have a partnership with a company that's out of Florida uh, called Hall Systems. And what it is, is we enable these labs that you can actually click on uh, under TechNet that is completely free. Uh, it's a, I think it's the lab gives you three or four hours of, of usage time, if I'm not mistaken. And you actually walk through a scenario. Um, if you, we actually run IT camps as well, which is very similar. But the benefit of the IT camps is you're in a classroom that's completely free for an entire day, and I'm there, or my counterpart Pierre is there. To help you go through the labs and then to answer your questions. Um, the TechNet V Labs, similar labs, not as detailed as the ones that we run at the camp, but same thing. It's a, it's a VM that's running out of Florida, and you're able to walk through steps to highlight specific functionality around Azure AD and for other technology. So definitely check that out as well. How are we doing for time? Are we still good? That's uh, quarter to eight. I just found a, a blog post for you actually. So uh, it's talking, it's published on, my bad, one sec. <clears throat> published on the 30th of January, so it's only a few weeks old. And it says um, they released an announcement about Windows Server and System Center v next because people were asking with Windows 10 coming out. Um, we plan to release further previews to the remainder of 2015 with the final release in 2016. Uh, the next preview is planned for the spring of 2015, and Windows Server will continue to share the same core technology as Windows. In fact, the next version of System Center Config Manager will ship in a time frame that aligns with Windows 10. So that's the latest. Cool? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Andrew. No problem. Remember seeing it somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just had to find it. Thank you. No problem. You remember about last year, the answer. They have a input of the uh, Windows 7 or Windows 8 with a Samsung. With Samsung? Or? So, so Samsung? So Android. Android, Android, right. Android, right. Android. So, so Samsung had that too. Samsung, Samsung did a deal with VMware on Verizon that allowed them to spin up so you would have a Windows 8 implementation on a tablet and they can click on an icon and can run it. Which I thought was interesting because, okay, so why would you want to spin up Android on Windows 8? It's great if you do it, but why, right? Um, if there's a specific app that only runs on Android, definitely see a purpose for it. Um, is it coming to Windows 10? Probably not, but obviously third party software will enable it to, to do that type of functionality. 
Um, so it, it is available. Um, Samsung is one of the OEMs that are on board for Windows 10. Uh, we're working very closely with that. Them on Chrome and on, on uh, PC. Uh, as, as is Acer and Asus and all of the, all of the other OEMs. Um, I think what's really interesting is you're hearing about all the news about the upcoming Mobile World Congress that's happening in Barcelona and the amount of Windows phones that they're these companies are building, um, and they're the cheap and cheerful ones, the sub two hundred dollars stuff, right? You're getting a lot of those, and it's been it's been pretty interesting to see, you know, all these starting to spring up. Um, you know, and then you hear the oh, Windows Phone is dead, last kick of the can, on and on and on. Um, I think you know what, and this is a personal opinion, I'm very smart of Microsoft to go after the low end devices, hundred to hundred and fifty bucks, because. Not anybody can go out and spend $700 on a phone, right? And if you can buy a tablet now for, you know, eight, nine bucks. Back a couple of years ago, I, I helped with a deployment um, in the province of Manitoba with Windows to Go sticks. There was a scenario where, you know, it was too expensive to give kids computers, or kids couldn't buy their own computers. Uh, we did this initiative where we gave out tablets, and the tablets ended up at the pawn shop where they were sold. None of the kids kept it. So, you know, doing a Windows to go, Windows to go key at the time was, you know, it was 40 bucks for this key, but the kid would have full implementation of Windows in their profile locked to them. So if they went to go sell the key, can't do anything, can't format it because it's already it's a bit locked and go, you can't do, you can't, it's useless. Um, and they would plug it into the library computer and it boots up, and away you go, you have your full computer. Now let's take that to a $79 or $89 tablet. So for 90 bucks, you have this tablet, again, locked out specific to the end user, can't do anything with it, can't format it, can't do anything with it. But it's 90 bucks and have a computer. And you walk into a library, and the screen at the library supports Miracast, or if you have a dongle from the micro HDMI, you have a full computer and port your keyboard, and away you go. You know, but that's all changing, right? And, and so what's even more interesting is that you have these tablets that are iOS or Android, which are great. And, you know, um, there's specific, specific functionality being available, but they're three, four, five, six hundred, seven hundred dollars. You know, where is this all going, right? Like, where are, are we going to start working and continue seeing these high-end, expensive tablets, or is, is now that bubble pop? Because a lot of people complain, well, where's the high end Windows phone? Why don't you have a Windows phone that competes with all the other hardware that's out there? Mm -hmm. You don't need to. Yeah, in China, there's about thirty or thirty dollars for a seven inches tablet. Yeah. It's only for the general communication. So it's no need to pay too much. We did a deployment with Royal Caribbean, the cruise line, uh, with tablets that are eighty dollars. They were custom built out of uh, China, I believe they were, and they're all running Windows eight. And very similar with regards to the state rooms and the conditions that they're in. And the, and the servers can use a priority. Uh, we have the airlines in Europe, I think it was, oh, the name of the right now, where they have Windows Phone doing the transactions for all the um, payments for food on the plane. And, and the, the biggest thing for them was the ease of tying it into back end systems. What's interesting though is that we're not just stopping at our own platform, we're also making that functionality made available on iOS and Android. Because, hey man, we understand you guys probably deployed that in some scenarios. So we're not going to say, no, no, go out and buy new machines. No, we understand that, you know, for us, it's the enablement of the platform more so than something hard. Right? And that makes, it, it's a big change. And when Satya came into play, the first thing they did was launch Office for, for iOS. Huge. That was, you know, never done before. Right? And now you're seeing Office for Android. Um, will there be an office for BlackBerry? Me, not. Um, <laughs> will there be a BlackBerry? Will there be a BlackBerry? You know what? I hope there is. Um, I heard Samsung is going to buy I personally don't think Samsung will buy, um, uh, will be allowed to buy BlackBerry for secure, for secure reasons. Um, I hope, my biggest challenge with BlackBerry is their offering hasn't changed since 90. Same thing, not set up, you know, what have you, it's very secure, don't get me wrong. I'm a little bit challenged in that all the data flows to the knock. 
regardless if you have a black room or not, when you're using a bed. So if you enable beds on a mobile device, iOS or Android, um, all your data flows to the knock and comes back. If the knock goes down, which never never happens, your data on your device will stop. My question in regards to this, and just, again, personal opinion, if you have a rooted device, and we've already agreed that 100% full proof that you can detect if the device is rooted or not. If you have a rooted device with malware on the device, and it's tied into the knock, and now I have this in, again, not tested, just a theory, no proof, do you gain access to the knock? Once you're in the stream of that channel, of the security that's made available through banks, which are, it's, it's, it's a glass house. You can't get inside, but when you're inside, I have gain access to all the data. If your device has been compromised, do you have access to the data? I don't know. But it's something to test. It's a scary thought. Right? I'm, I'm very excited to see what BlackBerry can do in mobile workloads. You know, the QNX software is pretty compelling on the Internet of Things. And there's a great opportunity for us at Microsoft to work with them in terms of identity and enablement. We're not here to squash out other lessons. We're here to help grow the platform to enable devices that it makes sense to enable. Right? Um, truth be told, if you had Exchange 2007 or higher, you can actually manage your BlackBerry 10 device natively through Accuracy. There are 17 policies that you can deploy and don't even require the beds at all. It would still get your email. Right? Uh, that was the change that happened when we launched Factory 10. Doesn't work on the legacy devices, but it works on the newer, the newer devices. I hope they survive. I hope John Chen turns it around because um, I would love to see some collaboration between us in terms of identity management of these devices. Who knows? It's a much different world. Um, from way back when. Which isn't even that long ago. No, that's a couple of years. Yeah. So I heard that they've uh, done some improvements in the command prompt. Is there any, like, being able to paste in and a bunch of other stuff, they didn't really spend much time on it. Can you elaborate on some of that in your sense? All I can tell you right now is the copy and paste functionality made available in the command prompt. That's the only thing, that's the only thing I can tell you today. Yeah, okay. um, improvements in PowerShell. That in. So there will be a new offering on PowerShell. I can't go into detail, unfortunately, as of yet. There will be improvements made to how many people are downloading PowerShell right now. It's freaking awesome, man. I tell you, I can't. I'm not a coder, and I've been dabbling with PowerShell for the last two years. It's like, really? How many people are using the PowerShell history of you, history of you are on Windows Server? A couple of you? Again, holy smokes. I had somebody at AD. And I can extrapolate the PowerShell uh, command list and did that and create my own script. Right? Uh, one of the guys who attended the camp was telling us, you know, he, he, he does disaster recovery once a month, but used to take him five guys in one week to do disaster recovery testing. He now does as he likes to show off. I'm at a Starbucks sipping my coffee for two hours with my iPad connected in via Azure Web Access, sorry, PowerShell Web Access, deploying uh, command lists. And doing disaster recovery testing. Right? <laughs> if you can learn PowerShell, do it. Uh, I myself, for dabbling into PowerShell for Azure, which is a different subset, um, wow, it's, yeah. Uh, I don't know the extent of what PowerShell commands will increase or be made available on Windows 10, but obviously it will be coming. Uh, my hope, and fingers crossed, uh, would be for, in the command prompt sense. To have a PowerShell ISC interface would be nice. That was my ask. Um, to have the command line for we're all full time IT pros. We've all gone to the command prompt and done specific What was the version of their V6? What was that? For PowerShell. Four. Four. Right? So there will be something new. I don't have details as of yet, but yeah, it's going to be new in a long time. Cool. Yeah, my suggestion for Windows 10, we were allowed to suggest as well. Because I would love to see command prompt uh, ISC type of thing. <laughs> have, you, have you guys played with the PowerShell ISC tool? Uh, so I'd love to see that online commands on the side. 
and then we just copy paste and snip it in and we create it. So, anything else? Or is it beer o'clock yet? You should plug your camp tomorrow and there's some free spots. Is there free spots in my camp? Yeah. So, if you guys want to join me, I'm deliberately modernizing the data center camp, which will be going through uh, Windows Server 2012 Part 2 functionality. Uh, how many people are in the midst of the 2003 migration need right now? A couple of you are shaking your head. If you are free tomorrow uh, and are interested in getting hands on experience into the capabilities of 2012 uh, R2, HTTP aka forward slash can I take pro camps? Oh, yeah, I'm a good idea. <laughs> AKA yeah, there's um, still, I think, 10 spots available. And the camp's taking place at uh, Thurlow and Pender. There's a place called CTC Train Canada that's a learning partner. And they have classrooms, so that's where Anthony's going to be all day tomorrow. What's over there, Ken? Vietnam would be okay. If you go to my blog, I have a link for it on there. You can download it today. Um, I don't know what I have to do. I do need one. You want to tether to my phone? No, I can do it with yeah, Terry's not a different country, even though we're 40 below. <laughs> Feels like it, doesn't it? I was, I'm, I'm wearing this jacket because I'm like, from, from Antarctica? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> it's just Toronto. And then I go to Halifax next week. There's also an Azure camp next week. So what Anthony's doing tomorrow for modernizing your data center, it's a full day event with hands-on labs. There's one on Tuesday, the same link that he just sent out or put up there. If you'd like to register, it's called Getting Started with Microsoft Azure for IT Professionals. Yeah. And that's all in the same link. Yeah, same location, and that'll be Pierre Roman. Uh, and then he's doing an Ask Us Anything here on Tuesday night. Yeah, so after that camp on the Tuesday, he'll be here doing a cloud Ask Me Anything. So everybody should have one ticket. Are you going to here? No. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, go, behind you. go behind you. Everybody get a ticket? That's OK. You're here now. So this is not a Windows to go stick. Um, Vantug has some budget issues, so we're just getting low, low grade equipment. But uh, it is 64 gigs, so um, it'll help you out. We'll get Andrew to uh, pick a winner. Choose, a, choose, choose one there. You it's can't see which is which. So. That'll be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> is this one yours? This one? Yeah, okay. I trust you. Uh, three four zero two nine zero. Two nine zero. Winner. We have a winner. Um, my friend. I try. I try. Um, and we're always looking for more prizes. So if anybody's working with somebody who has a little bit of budget that wants to give us some prizes, so we can give them back out to you, just let me know. That's how we do it around here. We rob from Peter and pay for. I made some notes about uh, Windows to go stick. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Can I take pro camps? Yes. So here's Can I pro here. Here's where you want to download. Like we have, a, so I have a step-by-step -by -step creating a Windows 10 uh, to go workspace. And you can download the preview right from there. So I'm going to give you the latest and greatest one. Just go to Can I take pro.net. Go to the AKA Oh, that's for the IT camp. So if you go to Can I take pro.net, you get the blog. If you want to go to aka.ms can it pro camps. There we go. So we have for Vancouver, we have my session tomorrow on modernizing the data center. And then we have on the third, we have the Pierre um, Azure Rights and Questions. Tomorrow, my friend. Uh, all day. Sorry, you're back. Yeah. Uh, CTC Train Canada. If you register, it'll give you the full address. He said it's uh, Pender and Thurlow. I know by how the building looks. I mean, it it's free. Yeah, free. free breakfast, lunch, full day of training. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. And there's ten spots left. There's ten spots. Enough left. for everybody in the room. If there you go. If you're available. And the Azure one calls me because it's about the same Friday. space. Friday. Is it sunny tomorrow? It better be. I'm going to be on Vancouver Island. Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> there's as many spots for the Azure one next Tuesday as well. So. Thanks. Uh, uh, single sign-on? Single sign-on? I can't answer that for you yet. 
Is uh, Microsoft still running the tech days? Events? Well, that's um, a great question. Wow. Uh, I actually ran the last one, which was 2011. Okay. And um, just as a bit of background, what happened was um, the team that we work on, which is called uh, DX, or for developer experience, we uh, used to be just focused on audience satisfaction across the country. And so we put on a series of tech days events. And then what the way that we were being measured for success was a lot more app focused after that. And we tried running tech days in 2011 to get, we had hackathons and workshops and getting developers building apps and uh, it didn't work. Like nobody was building apps. So we had to evolve the way that our organization tried to accomplish what we do. And unfortunately we couldn't continue to run tech days. We just didn't have the resources on our team. Um, so what we, what's been happening since then is we sponsor, we, the idea was instead of throwing our own party, let's help other people throw that same party. So have you heard of the iTech conference? Uh, they are coming in October to Vancouver. They just, uh, they're, they're just about to announce their Western dates. Um, I would recommend looking at the iTech conference. iTech, I-T-E-C-H. Uh, and then we also, um, one of our business groups, the Cloud and Enterprise Group, they're running an um, annual event now called the Cloud and Mobility Summit, and that has training for IT pros as well. And so, uh, so we did one in. It was January. We did well. We did Calgary and Toronto in December, yeah. or November, December, and I think there's one. There's a cloud camp. It's just cloud. It's not mobility coming to Vancouver. I believe in March. What I can do is I'll get your email address and then I'll get the exact date and everything. Yeah. Uh, so they're running those events. We also have a calendar on the Canon T Pro site and has all the events that we're at. And the other change that happened was we went from like large scale uh, breadth events to more depth focused events like our IT camp. So instead of trying to have an event where there's three or four hundred people um, going to events that are more 20 people in a room um, in front of a machine doing hands on. Uh, and part of that was, was audience feedback. We were hearing from IT pros that they wanted hands on. In that atmosphere, right? And so, we kind of wanted to get the schedule and calendar and see what's. Happening. I'll grab your email, and then what I've just shared with you, I'll put it into like here. Here are some of the events, like iTech, the the Cloud Summit coming to Vancouver, yeah, right. a few other things I can recommend. Steve, your event today? Oh. So it's on there, and then next week's uh, with, with Pierre doing the Ask Us Anything Cloud. Yeah. So we have we, we list all the dates on there. 